So tonight's topic is going to be about uh, the use of aspirin for fertility and whether or not it's beneficial. So um, aspirin definitely has been used for a very long time in the infertility world. Essentially people thought either because it reduced inflammation or because it improved blood flow that it would be useful to improving uh, fertility, aspirin. So it's been used for many years for the purposes of determining if um, you could uh, help with uh, fertility, uh, mostly for blood flow and for inflammation purposes. So this has been tried numerous times in every aspect of fertility. And we also wanted to make sure that it was, oh, they're still saying there's no sound. <laughs> Folks on Facebook, there's lots of sound, but apparently on Instagram, we're having real trouble. So basically uh, what we've ended up doing is uh, looking through those studies for you and there's three sort of main studies that are important. So there is one trial called the EAGER trial and that was the uh, effects of aspirin in gestation and reproduction trial. And during that trial, what they were able to demonstrate uh, was that the clinical pregnancy rate, so that's seeing a live heartbeat in the baby, uh, did improve in patients that were naturally trying to conceive, but that actually uh, were not using any fertility therapy or treatments at all. And there were subgroups within those groups that actually showed a significant benefit as well, including women with higher degrees of inflammation, and there was actually a higher live birth rate in the patients who had had a previous loss. So there were certain subgroups that benefited from the aspirin. More uh, to the point, they also showed that there are reductions in miscarriages in some studies, and that's been controversial because there have been some studies that say that there is no benefit and other studies that have shown that there is a benefit. Finally, the most important stuff was just released last week, and that was the reason I chose this topic, and that's from The Lancet. Oh good, now we finally have sound. Um, and on The Lancet article, or in The Lancet article, they demonstrated a 19% decrease in the risk of preterm delivery. So for those of you that have been my patients and gone through fertility treatment or even pregnancy with us, you all probably know that I've put you on aspirin and I've kept you on aspirin through the pregnancy and people frequently will say why. And years and years ago, there was actually a meta-analysis when they pool a bunch of different studies together and then analyze it as one big study population. And that study demonstrated a reduction in preterm delivery, even though that was not the primary outcome of the study. They were actually looking at whether or not it reduced preeclampsia or high blood pressure in pregnancy, which it does. So based on that secondary outcome of reduced preterm labor, I used it for years because I thought it was reducing preterm labor. Sure enough, in this randomized controlled trial in The Lancet, which is one of the world's premier scientific journals, they did demonstrate this 19% reduction in preterm delivery. So for patients who are going through fertility treatment, Hopefully many of you already know that you are slightly higher risk than normal and because of that there is a higher incidence of preterm labor, preterm delivery. So by using the aspirin, you're actually reducing the risks of preterm delivery, you're reducing preterm labor risk and that is huge because the outcomes for the babies that we are creating is as important as the creation of the babies. And we do not want you to get pregnant but then deliver a baby too early where now we're dealing with compromise, morbidity, mortality, um, months in the NICU, very high costs, um, obviously emotional, anxiety provoking, um, and then there's long-term morbidities, breathing difficulties, hearing difficulties, feeding difficulties, intelligence, um, visual problems. So we really want to minimize all of those and the number one determinant of all of those risks is actually whether or not you have delivered the baby prematurely. So aspirin for fertility treatment itself does have some benefits under certain circumstances. So again, for those of you that were just signing on on Instagram, my apologies for the technical glitches, but we were talking about whether or not it was helpful and the reality is that it does appear to be helpful in certain subgroups Clinical pregnancy rate in a trial called the EAGER trial, which was recent, was improved. 
And we also know that uh, the um, live birth rate was improved in a specific subgroup of patients, especially those who had one previous loss or more. Um, there are many studies, both uh, sort of yay or nay, in terms of favoring the use of aspirin in fertility patients. But I think overall, the reduction in preeclampsia, the reduction in preterm labor, and the possible increase in pregnancies it does really justify its use. So as far as fertility factor fiction for aspirin use in pregnancy is concerned, we do think it's beneficial, or at least I think it's beneficial. I think the data supports its use and it should be used in the majority of patients. There are some exceptions though. And so if you are going to have your risk increased for bleeding, if you have an abnormality that makes you bleed more easily, you have a von Willebrand's disease or syndrome, then these are things that we need to take into consideration. If you are sensitive to aspirin or have an allergy to aspirin, that's also something that we need to take into consideration. And then obviously people who would be at excessive risk from a bleeding episode, whether they're low in their hemoglobin already or they've had previous complications with bleeds in the pregnancy, it's never just a, you know, one sort of treatment for everybody. So um, basically, if you're trying to get pregnant, even naturally, it does look like aspirin is beneficial. There are studies that show that it can be beneficial in fertility patients undergoing treatment, although there are also some that disagree with that. Um, but the long-term pregnancy outcomes are definitely reduced, and I think a lot of these studies are hampered by the fact that they didn't start the aspirin early enough. So we start our patients on it before they ever even get pregnant. A lot of these studies uh, start the aspirin way too late, and I think that's why they're not getting the results that we want. So uh, fact or fiction, yes, aspirin should be used when you are trying to get pregnant. And um, I'm gonna start taking questions. Uh, hopefully that was interesting, and if any of you have any questions about aspirin use in uh, pregnancy, don't hesitate. Okay, so. Um, on Facebook, we've got a question that says, what would you recommend for a woman that has multiple miscarriages but has no problem conceiving, has tried IUI, and is currently taking aspirin daily and progesterone? Do you feel heparin would be better even with genetic testing clear? Yeah, that's an awesome question. So. Um, the data for this actually does not support heparin and aspirin use together for reducing recurrent pregnancy loss, but I actually am going to say that I disbelieve that data and I do use heparin and aspirin because we've seen it work. So uh, clinically speaking, I do support its use, even if you've done what's called a thrombophilia screen and you've run through all of the testing that we are aware of and you're still demonstrating that there is no significant uh, concern um, in terms of your risk of having blood clots. I still think if you've had multiple miscarriages in the past that aspirin and uh, heparin together are definitely more power powerful than aspirin alone. And I think there is an anti-inflammatory aspect of heparin that is stronger than aspirin and that also may be beneficial because you may not be miscarrying because of blood clots you may be miscarrying because of inflammation or an immune attack and heparin may be beneficial in that regard so I do use both progesterone definitely again all of these need to be started at the right time and you need a comprehensive evaluation if you've had multiple miscarriages um, there is a mention in your post there in regards to doing IUI um, so IUI does not actually make any difference to whether or not you're going to have a miscarriage so if anyone has ever told you you should do IUI because you've had multiple previous miscarriages that's not actually going to be beneficial and there's no data in regards to that at all. So uh, definitely uh, use uh, the heparin and the aspirin, um, but it's not gonna be beneficial specifically to IUI um, in terms of helping you miscarry less. Okay, so another question, whoops, sorry. Another question on Facebook. Uh, do your patients have Clexane as well as aspirin during stims? Um, I think Clexane is, Definitely not Canadian. I'm not sure what Clexane actually is. Um, I've heard of it before, but uh, it's not used in Canada, so I'm not familiar with that product. If it's a progesterone, we definitely have our patients on progesterone. If it's something else, I'm not quite sure. Um, 
Okay, so another patient asked on Instagram, and I think I can use this guy now, right? Yeah, uh, just jumped on now, but in case you didn't answer yet, what age is considered old to have a baby? Okay, so if you follow our Instagram posts, you will know that I vehemently cannot stand the uh, term geriatric pregnancy. So, um, you know, there's no data on how old you are or, or at what age you are too old to have a pregnancy. Once you are over the age of 35, the risk of miscarriage and genetic abnormality begins to increase, but is certainly not considerable until you're getting into your 40s. Once you're over 43, it actually starts becoming very difficult to conceive even with assistance, and that's even advanced assistance. And once you're up past sort of you know, the late 40s and into your 50s, the risks of genetic abnormalities and miscarriage are really quite high. So for example, at 50, your risk of downs is almost 10%. Your risk of miscarriage is probably over 90%. So that's using your own eggs. If you're using someone else's eggs, it's a completely different story. And at that point, point it's much more an issue of whether or not um, socially it's a, appropriate for you to have a pregnancy because the average lifespan is probably somewhere between 75 to 80. So if you're having a baby and you are 50 something years old, you have to understand that um, your child is going to be with you potentially only for 20 or 25 years and then unfortunately because of natural causes you may not be able to be there for the child. So there are some ups and downs but if you're real healthy, you're long lived, you, you have a family history of long life, yeah I mean we certainly have no problems with it and I don't judge anybody so I let them choose, I never choose for them. Uh, okay one more from Instagram. Was I told to take Tylenol instead of aspirin? No, um, it's always aspirin, definitely not Tylenol. Um, and another question just saying, how early should aspirin you start before your frozen embryo transfer or beginning of a transfer cycle? Um, I'm actually a believer that you should do everything well before. You really want your body to kind of achieve what we call homeostasis, so it's kind of level and it's balanced and it's used to what's going on in your physiology and the sooner you start your meds um, if it's an appropriate med like aspirin uh, the better off you are don't do that with progesterone it'll turn into birth control that definitely would not be good for fertility okay um, if you're on prescribed heparin should you continue taking the daily aspirin as well? So yeah, absolutely, you should take aspirin and heparin together if the situation necessitates it. Is it true that you are bringing IVF to Windsor? Also, is the cost going to be lower? Also, what is the current wait time for IVF in your clinic? Okay, so yes, we are currently bringing IVF to Windsor. Um, we're really excited about that, so that should be happening very, very soon. The final bits and pieces are going in this week and next. Um, the cost will be a general a little bit lower than what's national. We're still setting final pricing, but the goal is to make it very affordable. In particular for our American uh, patrons, it's gonna be a, probably about a half to a third of what you would pay for an average cycle in the US. So we are really very uh, much hoping to make it aggressive pricing. And um, there is no wait time if you're looking at doing a private cycle. Uh, we can do that at any point in time for you. So don't hes hesitate if you're doing a private cycle, we're more than happy to help you out. Um, okay, someone with low platelets, you would not put them on aspirin then. Um, no, usually if your platelets are low, you're probably a little bit of a higher risk of developing a blood clot, uh, sorry, of a bleeding disorder, and so you would want to avoid um, using aspirin in that situation. I had an allergic reaction when I was a child. Um, swallow eyes. Should I try it again? I'm not quite sure what you mean by swallow eyes. I think you mean swollen eyes. Um, no, do not try aspirin again if you had an allergic reaction. For sure, don't try that again. Um, another question, how does Graves' disease affect a pregnancy? So this one's on Instagram. Okay, so Graves' disease is when your thyroid um, is not reacting properly and you are producing antibodies typically to your thyroid. And if you are producing antibodies, uh, it can alter the function of the thyroid and the antibodies themselves have been proven to be detrimental to pregnancy, um, including increasing the risk of miscarriage. So number one, it can deter you or slow you down from getting pregnant. 
Number two, it can compromise the pregnancy as far as miscarriage risks. And number three, if it throws your thyroid hormones off enough, um, there are neurodevelopmental outcome issues with the fetus that are important. So. Um, all the endocrinological societies uh, and the American Society of Reproductive Medicine suggest that your TSH, your thyroid stimulating hormone, should be kept fairly low, ideally around 2.5 to 3 in the first trimester or less than 2.5 in some studies, uh, in order to maximize or optimize your neurodevelopmental outcomes. So um, that's how Graves' disease affects it. It's both the getting pregnant, the staying pregnant, and then the outcomes of the pregnancy. So make sure you're getting that dealt with. Do you suggest aspirin before doing an injectable IUI cycle? When should you start on aspirin when doing injectable IUI? Yeah, so again, I, I think if you're gonna use aspirin, you should use it before you start your fertility programming. Um, so basically, when you're starting your shots, that's an ideal time, or even ahead of that, that's fine too. Um, Any time around then is fine, as long as it's in play before you're actually seeing what happens uh, with a um, actual IUI or an IVF uh, embryo transfer or, or insemination. Um, okay, do I do the IUI myself in Sarnia? Uh, no. So actually in both centers um, and in most centers throughout uh, the world, IUIs are mostly done by nurses. Um, our nurses are awesome. I did train them all. Um, they're very good at doing it, even the difficult ones they can usually do. These days, pretty much the only IUIs they ever have to do are the ones where it is extremely difficult, a very stenotic cervix or the patient that's had a really bad um, sort of outcome previously where they really had a difficult time with the insemination. It was uncomfortable for them. So the vast majority of IUIs are done by nurses. We do track the results to make sure the nurses are getting the same results that I am or did, um, and they were getting the exact same results. So there was no difference between us, and that's why I I'm uh, totally in support of our nurses doing it. And a shout out to all my nurses. It is uh, nursing year. I think it's nursing and midwife year. So a uh, huge shout out to you. I love you all ladies, all of our staff. You're all incredible people and thank you for everything you do. You guys are amazing and we would not be here and there would be a lot fewer babies that we have helped uh, you know, bring into this world if it wasn't for you guys. So I couldn't do it without you. I am just a member of an amazing team um, and my team is literally the best. So I love you guys. Thank you for everything you do. Um, and that goes for all the staff, not just the nurses. Okay, um, someone is asking again uh, about Clexane. I don't know what Clexane is, so if you wanna tell me what Clexane is, I will answer that. Um, low-dose aspirin or regular, yeah, use low-dose. That's what most of the studies have done. So that's the 81 milligram tablet, not the 325. Um, please talk about unexplained infertility for 40 plus women, thanks. Um, okay, so uh, we talk about this pretty much every week um, and I'll talk about it again, uh, but it's a, always a good topic. So unexplained infertility really doesn't make a difference despite your age. There's always four choices. So choice number one is that you can try doing uh, insemination with oral medications. So that would be letrozole or Clomid. You can try doing insemination with injectable medications. You can try doing uh, IVF, or you can do surgery to determine if you have endometriosis or scarring or adhesions and so on. Those are the only four things that actually have been proven to be beneficial. So if you look at the studies, in general, there's about a three to 4.1% chance of conceiving naturally when you have unexplained infertility. If you're just taking Clomid or just taking Letrozole, you're not any higher than the normal three to 4%. In fact, it's about 3.8%. So it's a little bit lower than the most you can achieve naturally. If you're doing just IUI, there's a great uh, Scottish study that demonstrated no benefit to just IUI, so that's not gonna help you either. Um, IVF definitely helps, and like I said, surgery can help. But when you mix the IUI with the medication, so the, um, you're using the Clomid or the Letrozole with the injectables as well, uh, you definitely start to see improvements. It's about double that 4% rate, 3% um, rate, so you're looking anywhere from about 7 to 8% with the pills, and as high as 20% with the shots, although at that rate you are also starting to see an increase in the risk of having multiples, so you may have 
more than uh, one at a time. Um, I'm not sure if one of my uh, clients is watching right now. Uh, she and her husband just found out the other day that they were having twins and um, they were uh, literally telling each other how much they hated each other in the room um, as a joke. It was quite funny. So uh, congrats to you guys. You know I love you both and uh, that was pretty hilarious to be part of that dialogue. Um, so definitely got to be careful when we're doing shots. Uh, I've had two previous miscarriages and one with the DNC ever since the DNC. That's a dilation and curettage where you're evacuating the uterus surgically. My cycles have been extremely heavy, so much so I've been sent to the ER. I am never symptomatic and my hemoglobin has always... Uh, oh, I hate doing this. Always been... Uh, well within normal range. Would you still advise aspirin? Um, well, first I'd advise that you figure out why you're having such heavy cycles um, and then you need a full workup. So I wouldn't just automatically advise anything. I think you need to figure out what's going on first and then make sure that you, um, you know, get a chance to go through that and figure out exactly what's necessary to protect you. Okay. Um, let me make sure I haven't missed anything. What's the range of that? And what made you get into fertility? Oh, that's a great question. What made me get into fertility? Um, so uh, I'm a religious guy and I love helping people. Um, that's kind of part of my faith. I'm a Baha'i. So uh, this was a great way to help people. Um, what could be better than helping people become families? I also happen to love babies. Even when I was young, I used to love taking care of babies. Um, so helping people to make babies and have their own families is just an absolutely incredible opportunity. Um, those of you who really know me probably realize that I'm a bit of an action junkie as well. And there is nothing more exciting than being an OBGYN. So um, these bags under my eyes are from last night's night of call, uh, where I literally did not get a wink of sleep. And uh, it's an amazing thing. I mean, bringing life into the world. Sometimes there's emergencies, there's surgical emergencies. I get to do a little bit of everything. So I do my own ultrasound, so I get to do a little bit of radiology. I do the fertility work. There's a lot of primary care being an OBGYN. We get the whole aspect of doing obstetrics, which is incredible. You get a little bit of cancer, hematology, endocrinology. Um, so there's a lot of medicine in it. Uh, and then the whole field of surgery. And for those of you who've uh, been with me, you know I'm an advanced minimally invasive surgeon. So I get to do a ton of surgery and, and that's really awesome for me. I love being in the OR. I have an amazing assistant who's a family physician in town and we have a riot when we're in there together. It's a lot of fun. We do really good work and uh, the patients have always had really good outcomes so far. So uh, we're really blessed and I feel totally blessed to have the opportunity to help people. So that is why I'm a fertility specialist. Okay. Um, do you have to have a prescription for heparin? Yes. That one's so easy. Please, unexplained infertility at 40 plus plus. So I went over that. I don't think there's anything specific about being over the age of 40. You're no different than anyone else going through fertility. So just because you're over the age of 40, if you're unexplained, the only difference is you wanna hurry. So you may wanna consider doing IVF or the surgery sooner rather than going through months of IUI. But otherwise, there really is no difference. You should really just keep doing the same things, look at those four options and make sure you talk to your physician to make sure that they're doing the right thing for you. So a little bit more pressure to be urgent, but definitely no difference in what should be done or what your options are. It's always the same. Um, as always, uh, please like, comment, share. Uh, we love it when you guys do that. Um, send me your questions, um, ask us on Instagram or Facebook and we will definitely try and get back to you. Are there restrictions with sending donor sperm from the US to Canada? I see on some donor websites they're UK or Australian compliant, but I haven't noticed anything for Canada. Um, there are, but most of the uh, agencies that support uh, Canadian donor sperm uh, supply uh, have already taken care of all of that. So you can get donor sperm from things like Fairfax Cryobank in Canada um, without any difficulty. Uh, 
uh, as long as it meets the, the, our standards and our criteria, it can come across the border. Um, generally speaking, I think we are fairly strict with our restrictions and rules and so on, um, but it is very possible. Uh, okay, would use of progesterone injects, injections in late pregnancy affect lactation post-delivery? Uh, it shouldn't. All the hormones change right at delivery and they're so powerful they typically overwhelm your progesterone um, levels. So that shouldn't be a significant issue. Um, and you shouldn't be on progesterone late in the pregnancy. The longest we ever carry anyone is till 37 weeks. The odd, odd time when someone is desperate not to go into labor because uh, a family member is abroad or can't be back in time, we'll still use it a little bit longer, but I generally shy away from that. So 36 weeks, we start telling people they can stop, 37 at the most, and you should stop. Um, so it shouldn't affect any, um, you know, sort of significant risks of lactation. Um, okay, one of my favorite patients is asking me a very nice question, but I don't need to repeat that one. <laughs> um, do you prescribe low-dose aspirin uh, or over-the-counter regular aspirin? Um, I always prescribe low-dose aspirin, um, and the reason for that is many of our patients have coverage, and regular dose is probably a bit strong. So low-dose, and I mentioned that a little bit earlier. Um, okay, so uh, are there any exercise restrictions after an IUI insemination? Yeah, keep your heart rate under 120. Don't go to spin class. Somebody always asks me about volleyball. Don't play volleyball. No hot yoga, nothing extreme. Kind of take it easy. Um, keep your weightlifting probably under 15, 20 pounds. Of course, if you're built like, uh, you know, Schwarzenegger, then you might be able to accommodate a little more. And if you're average, um, maybe a little bit less. So uh, keep it reasonable. Is there any motile sperm in pre-ejaculation? Uh, yes, there can be. Um, there are people that have conceived with uh, um, some of the ejaculate uh, or pre-ejaculate, the pre-cum. So yeah, you need to be careful with that. Um, don't think that you're safe just because it's pre-cum. Okay. Um, how would you treat urea plasma, that's a bacterial infection of the cervix, during frozen embryo transfer and how would you treat it during pregnancy? Okay, so if you're doing an embryo transfer, you should ideally have your urea plasma treated way before and it is often difficult to eradicate. So you really should be getting the treatment ahead of time, not during or at the time of the embryo transfer. Um, how would you treat it during pregnancy? The antibiotics for urea plasma are generally safe in pregnancy, so that's not a problem. Although once you're pregnant, Again, it's kind of late and the association with urea plasma is for actual problems with miscarriage. So you want to definitely take care of that ahead of time, not after the fact. Uh, what is the wait time for funded IVF in our clinic? Um, well, uh, we don't have funding in the Windsor Clinic yet. We are working on it. Please, please, please write to your MPPs, write to the Minister of Health, write to anybody that will listen, go to the press. We need funding for Windsor, so we are working on that. We don't have a wait time for it right now. Um, what can I do? Oh, here's a great question. Uh, what can I do to help with the side effects of metformin, major diarrhea, since I started it? Okay, so, uh, hey, I'm sorry. Um, it is kind of rough taking metformin, and for those of you who are on it for PCOS or for a history of diabetes and pregnancy, um, it can be very, very uh, disturbing to your stomach. So, uh, met per day, sometimes four but don't ever start with that. So I always plead with all of you, do not start metformin at the three pills per day as prescribed. Start with one, wait till your stomach settles. That might take a month, it might take a week, but go slow. Then go up to two and space them out, and then go to three. Um, pretty much every pharmacist will support spacing it out so that you're having it um, uh, you know, at even intervals, so like every eight hours if you're doing it three times a day, and always take it with food as it'll reduce some of the disruption that it causes on an empty stomach. Um, if you're finding it's really bad, uh, there is the long-acting metformin, which actually has about a 40% reduction in side effects. So that's called glumetza, and um, it's just sustained release, and you can actually take all of the pills at the same time, and because it's releasing slowly, it doesn't have any difference in impact, so you don't have to space out the timing. So that's a really um, reasonable uh, approach to things. 
Okay. Um, can you skip IUI and go right to IVF? Yeah, absolutely you can skip IUI and go right to IVF. So there would be reasons to do that. Um, there may be uh, a desire to achieve the fastest success or the highest success as quickly as possible. Um, age may be a factor. Uh, sometimes it's the partner needing to be away. Um, if your IUIs have not succeeded before, or for example, you've had problems in the past with uh, cervical stenosis with IUIs, or your tubes are damaged from previous infection and so on. So yeah, there's like I could go on forever on that one. There are loads of reasons why you would want to go um, straight through to uh, IVF instead of starting with IUI, and that's totally reasonable. Uh, what are my thoughts on bed rest after FET? Uh, so we did a fact or fiction on that. Um, it should be on YouTube. Is that on YouTube? Yeah, it's on YouTube so you can look it up. Um, you don't actually need to rest, although we do ask our patients to do it. Um, it is not based on science. In fact, the science, as much as is available, does not support any benefit to resting. The problem is if it doesn't work, uh, God forbid, um, everybody sits there and wonders if it was because they got up and walked around or they got up and did something. So um, definitely uh, don't have to rest. What we tell most of our patients is do whatever stresses you the least. So if you think walking around or going back to work is going to be good for you, go back to work. That's perfectly fine. And if you think that putting your feet up and relaxing is good for you, um, then put your feet up and relax. I think that answers two of the people that were asking. Um, if I lift at work, um, oh, let me just answer the rest of that question. Is it safe to go back to normal activity a couple days after? It is definitely. I lift at work and wondering um, if that's something you should avoid after transfer. Yeah, uh, if you're lifting heavy, don't uh, do that. Um, strain probably is not great and there are some studies that have showed that, uh, for example, people that do heavy exercise and do heavy lifting actually can have a, a higher complication rate. So that's probably not ideal. Um, can pre-ejaculation cause a pregnancy? Uh, same question again. Um, in theory, yes, so be cautious. Um, I don't think it's common, but it definitely can happen. Okay, uh, let's flip back over to uh, Facebook. When talking about patients, I had Oh, sorry, platelets, not patients. I had low platelets during my first pregnancy with my son. We had a rough delivery. We had a code pink and was sent to the NICU. Upon checking him, he also had low platelets and uh, needed to have IVIG, intravenous immune globulin. Uh, and am and I am diagnosed with chronic idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura, ITP. Will next baby have the same outcome? Um, yeah, I tried to look this up after somebody asked it. It may have been you, and I could not find any data that would say that the next baby could have it as well. Um, but it is certainly possible, and if your baby is experiencing low platelets, um, there can be something called NATE, which stands for neonatal alloimmune thrombocytopenia, and that can be very, very devastating for baby because the baby can actually have a stroke while it is in utero. So um, we actually recently helped a couple out um, and I don't know if they're watching or not, but you guys are absolutely amazing. The whole family is incredible. Um, they had previously had something like this and um, we helped them via IVF and uh, using somebody else to uh, help them out in the process. So uh, I won't go into too many details, but um, there are ways around it that can help you and protect you and your baby. Um, so that's something you need to uh, consider. Uh, are there ultrasound guided IUI in Sarnia? Uh, not usually. So ultrasound guided IUI has been tested and not shown to be beneficial. Um, the only time we ever do ultrasound guided IUI is if um, it is extremely difficult to get into the cervix. There's actually no benefit to it otherwise. Um, if you really wanted us to do an ultrasound guided IUI, um, that would be something I would be doing for you. So come to Windsor and we would help you out here for sure. Um, when doing mini IVF, do you stim as long as a full IVF cycle? Uh, wow, that's a cool question. So mini IVF is when we limit your drug dose 
to no more than 150 units. So it's usually either 75 or 150 units of whatever you're using, Menopure, Gona Lef, any of those products. And um, yeah, so the stim is entirely dependent on your biology and your physiology. It's actually not related to um, the protocol. So if you're ready in 10 days, you go at 10 days. And if you're ready at nine days, you go at nine days. We do know that if you're ready very early, so less than eight or past 11, the success rates tend to decrease. So we're very cautious about that. But aside from that, the cycle length is not dependent on uh, the actual mini versus full or even natural. Um, natural is a little different just because it's natural and you're not taking any meds, um, but we still try and make sure we're following the same sort of guidelines. Someone's asking about what's your opinion on Ovacetol? Um, tell me what Ovacetol is. I'm familiar with Ovascience, but I am not familiar with Ovacetol. Uh, let me know what that is and I'll be happy to give you my opinion. Um, uh, we've got uh, someone in Facebook commenting that our girls are like family. Uh, they sure are. So I tell my girls I love them every day when I leave and I love you all. I'll, I'll say it in public here. <laughs> uh, um, what about taking CoQ10 during an IVF cycle? Yeah, um, there is some data that shows that coenzyme Q10 is actually beneficial for egg quality. Um, the problem is that same data suggests you need to take it for six months before it's really effective. So uh, take it, you gotta take a very high dose, um, about 600 milligrams per day in order to get maximum benefit. Um, but I do think that it is uh, worth doing. Um, who knows if a little bit is helpful, that hasn't been shown. Uh, we do ask our patients to take it in particular if they're older, where egg quality starts to get compromised. It's a very reasonable consideration. Enoxaparin sodium is an anticoagulant medication. It is used to treat and prevent deep vein thrombosis. Oh, is that what Clexane is? It's enoxaparin, that's just another type of heparin. Um, okay, let me see here. Um, yeah, so if Clexane is enoxaparin. Enoxaparin is a low molecular weight heparin. Um, so yeah, you can absolutely use enoxaparin. It's the same as using any other kind of heparin and, and it's one of the ones we use frequently. So that's fine. We just don't call it Clexane. Um, okay, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Oh, thank you. You are amazing. Uh, <laughs> how many patients on average do I see in a day? Uh, okay guys, so we set our own record on Monday of um, last week and uh, I didn't see them all. Some were getting ultrasounds and lab work, but we had 134 people run through here. So God bless all of you. Um, God bless my staff. And uh, for all of the amazing patients that went through here, um, we try and spend as much time as possible with all of you. So uh, despite the fact that it's busy, we do our best and uh, so far everybody's been pretty happy. So uh, you guys are all amazing for making this place a really great place to be. So thank you for that. Um, average, we probably see about 50, 40 or 50 people a day, um, plus the ultrasounds and the lab work, which will drive those numbers up a little bit higher. Okay, uh, actually, you know what? I think I need to go back to Instagram. Are empty follicles always due to low AMH or can it just be crappy luck? IVF worth it again? Um, yeah. Okay, so that is an absolutely amazing question. And the answer to that is, um, that it's difficult to know what causes empty follicles. Sometimes empty follicles are caused because they are genuinely empty, so there is no egg inside them. Sometimes it's because you did not release the egg. So typically, if we are doing an egg retrieval and we can't get the egg, we will try to do it uh, by flushing the egg out. And that's where you um, get the fluid from outside the media. We flush it back through the needle. It re-expands the follicle your needle is in the follicle and then you're just redraining it so it collapses again and hopefully you're, you're pulling out the egg. And frequently we will get an egg. In some women, despite our best efforts, it just doesn't work. So then you're starting to worry about either the fact that the egg hasn't released or that the follicle is just not there. The egg is actually just not there. 
Um, so both situations can occur. We typically test for egg release by measuring your LH or your HCG level, depending on whether you had a GnRH agonist trigger, then you measure LH, or an HCG trigger, obviously you measure HCG. Um, but if your levels are high uh, enough to suggest that the release has occurred, then there really is a difficult time figuring out what has happened. Is it worth trying again? It is, because typically what we do the next time around is hit you hard with every trigger there is. And frequently it actually does work. So we have seen people fail in one episode and then succeed again in the next. Um, but it really again depends on each patient. Uh, I think IVF, unfortunately, is always worth trying again. I say unfortunately because it's expensive and I hate the fact that sometimes we do have to try more than once, but you do. And we do learn something from every cycle that we do, so occasionally it takes more uh, than one try. Um, can you move the pregnancy blood test if your cycle is supposed to start before the two weeks after your IUI? Oh yeah, you can move your pregnancy blood test wherever you like. So that's not a problem. You can move it around all over the place. Um, I am strict, Nat. <laughs> uh, okay, I am in the US, but most of the OBs around me say they won't do any further testing until I've had at least three miscarriages. I've had two in less than a year's time. Is this a general for all OBs, a general rule I'm assuming you're saying uh, before being recommended? No, in fact, the current guidelines say two. So your OBs are out of date, unfortunately. Um, you should be seeing someone if you've had two. That's both ASRM and the ESHRI guidelines, the European Society. Um, so if you've had two or more miscarriages in a row, you should be seeing someone um, because it's very reasonable to anticipate that there may be something wrong. We can't always find what's wrong, uh, but it's certainly reasonable to go looking for something. Can 12 millimeter follicles have the chance to produce a viable embryo? Triggering tonight, for IVF retrieval, and I have a couple of them. Uh, highly unlikely, that egg size will likely be too small. We typically don't see a mature follicle until it's at least a 15. Um, it does depend on how it's being measured. So follicles can be measured if there's a circle with just like one line through the longest width. Um, sometimes you try and get the follicle into its average size and then measure one. Um, a lot of places will do a cross hatch where you're averaging two measures. Um, that's what we do because it seems to be most accurate. So uh, typically with what we are doing, um, you won't see a mature follicle till it's uh, 15. Um, depending on where you're going, they may try to mature your follicles. It doesn't work very well, um, but in some patients you get lucky, so um, don't lose hope. But if you have enough larger follicles, that's where the real focus should be. Um, When do you suggest taking aspirin for injectable IUI? Uh, I think I answered that already, but we tell people to take it when they start or even before. So when they're starting the shots. Would a case of lichen sclerosis impact desire to have a vaginal delivery? Uh, my desire for you to have a vaginal delivery, it, it could. Um, lichen sclerosis is an autoimmune condition which affects a lot of women. Um, typically doesn't happen in reproductive age women. It's either when you're really young or when you are sort of past your menopausal um, years, so over the age of 50 or, or 55. Uh, nevertheless, if you are presenting with lichen sclerosis and you are pregnant, if the tissue around the vulva and the vagina are already severely affected, I would definitely recommend that you um, have your doctor have a very long discussion with you about the benefits of doing a cesarean because that tissue will not necessarily heal as well as normal vaginal uh, tissue would that is not affected by lichen. If you do have lichen, um, we now have a, a laser clinic in Windsor called the Revitalized Medical Laser Center and um, uh, this is a totally gratuitous plug for our own clinic. Um, but we have a thing there called the Mona Lisa laser, and that is the absolute best treatment possible for lichen sclerosis. So um, go for the laser if you can afford it. If you can't, try a 15 week course of every three week injection of ceftriaxone because it actually has up to an 80% resolution for uh, lichen. So try that um, if it uh, is still bothering you. Otherwise it's chronic steroids and that has a lot of tissue side effects. 
Um, okay, back to Facebook. We're almost done, guys. At home many weeks, would you deliver if on Fragment? At home many weeks, would you deliver if on Fragman? Um, you know what? If you are uh, on Fragman, would we still deliver you? Yeah, I mean, we have to do it all the time. Um, it does depend if it's therapeutic dosing or prophylactic dosing. Prophylactic dosing actually doesn't make you um, bleed more, uh, but we are cautious and we watch you really carefully. Um, how often should you wait before taking your doses of metformin? Uh, just the eight hours if you're taking three a day. Um, oops. Why is, uh, you know what, let me ask again. Uh, what is involved in a recurrent loss panel? Um, okay, so depends on where you're going, um, but there are tons of uh, different things we look for. So genetic causes we look for, we look for your hormones, we look for your thyroid and antibodies to your thyroid, we look for cervical infections or endometrial infections via a biopsy. Um, I usually will do a thrombophilia screen, so we're looking for clotting disorders, lupus anticoagulant, um, anti-lupus uh, antibody, sorry, antiphospholipid antibodies, um, factor V Leiden, prothrombin gene mutation, G20120. Um, there's a whole host of them. So uh, that's sort of the basics of what we're looking for. We will do an evaluation of the shape of your uterus, make sure it doesn't have an abnormal shape. Um, so there are many different things we, we check, and then we go over them in great detail detail with you. Um, we eliminate uh, habits, so you have to see the patient's uh, lifestyle habits, smoking, drinking, marijuana use. Um, even weight can increase the risks of miscarriage, so sometimes that's something uh, that's important as well. Okay, would I recommend to someone in the veterinary industry to avoid taking x-rays while trying to conceive? Yeah, for sure. Um, wear lead and make sure you use those little uh, radiation exposure badges. Don't go over your exposure. Um, that's really important. So that's important for sure. Um, okay, I have the same person asking about ovacetol. Oh, it's a mixture of myo-inositol and d inositol Yeah. Um, especially if your PCOS, inositol is great. Um, we use Inosia from YAD, um, the, the vitamin company. But um, myo-inositol and D-chiro-inositol have been shown to be beneficial, in particular in PCOS patients. Um, shout out to our pharmacy who sells that stuff and to YAD. Uh, they're a great company for doing that. So yes, use it. It is very helpful. Um, update on the GTA clinic. I will know February 3rd. Um, so I will let you guys know as soon as I find out. Um, what are my thoughts on the serapeptase enzyme for unblocking tubes? Wow, I haven't seen anything about the serapeptase enzyme for unblocking tubes. Unblocking tubes is extremely difficult. Um, even when you do it manually, which is probably much stronger than anything else, the success rate is less than 40%. And that's where you actually take a, a radiologist, interventional radiologist, they have a very, very fine wire with a tiny little ball at the end of it, and they push that ball through the tube, kind of breaking any scars or adhesions that are in there. It still does not work very well. The yield is very, very low. Um, so I'm not sure about serapeptase enzyme. I've seen all sorts of stuff on the internet, like uh, putting castor oil packs on you and all sorts of herbs and drinking teas. Guys, that stuff is not gonna work um, whatsoever in terms of unblocking tubes. Um, so uh, I'd have to look up serapeptase enzyme. Tarek, uh, make sure you remind me to do that. We'll have an answer for you next time. You know what, that would be a, a great fact or fiction for next time, maybe we'll do that. What kind of things can unblock tubes? Um, uh, give me some likes if you want us to uh, do that for you next time. Then we'll know that that's the right thing to do. Um, how much of a role does AMH, anti-malarian hormone, play? Is low number something to be worried about? Um, is DHEA and CoQ10 safe to take before treatment? Do you believe these vitamins uh, can improve with number AMH number? Okay, so first of all, AMH uh, is anti-malarian hormone. A low number is important because it can mean that you will not produce as many eggs and it probably signifies egg quality may be compromised. 
It is not definitive, so there's no question that it's not 100% sure that you can't get a pregnant, uh, can't get pregnant, or can't have a successful pregnancy with a low AMH. Um, but it does make it more difficult, most likely. Uh, DHEA is not a vitamin; it's actually a hormone. Uh, CoQ10 is a supplement. Um, neither of those increase your AMH. Your AMH is related to the follicle count in your ovaries. Um, but those can help you make more eggs in the case of DHEA and hopefully better quality eggs in the case of uh, coenzyme Q10. Okay guys, so we are rounding up on 9 o'clock. I humbly apologize for our uh, technical glitches early on. Um, we are trying a really cool new device that uh, lets us broadcast in multiple formats with just one camera, but we got some homework to do on how to get the sound working. So we will be back up and running properly next week, I promise. Um, I am on call again next Monday night, so uh, we will be back Tuesday, uh, January or sorry, sorry, February the fourth, right? Is that the right date? So Tuesday, February fourth, eight o'clock. Send your questions. If you guys have ideas, um, let me know, and I will definitely be happy to engage those ideas for you guys, um, and we can go from there. I uh, hope you have a great night, uh, love to you all, and a uh, huge shout out to all the nurses uh, out there for Nurses Year, um, and uh, thank you to Allison who brought that to my attention. Love you guys, have a great night, we'll see you again next week, take care.